The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Caitlin Lustig. I'm TNC's South Florida Marine Conservation Manager, and I will be the host of this webinar. We have four panelists who are joining us today to talk about their work with non-branching coral species. We have Dr. Fenor Montoya Maya, who's the Director of Corallis de Paz and a Research Assistant at the Corporation Center of Excellence in Marine Sciences. He's based in Colombia, but has worked around the world. Andrew Taylor is the Director of Blue Corner Marine Research and based in Bali. Sam Burrell is a Senior Reef Restoration Associate with Coral Restoration Foundation here in Florida. And finally, Dr. Shai Shafir is a Senior Lecturer at Oranem College of Education in Israel. Next slide, please. This webinar is hosted by the Coral Restoration Consortium's Field-Based Propagation Working Group, which I co-chair along with David Suggett, who sends his best but couldn't be here today because of the time difference. We're a group of restoration practitioners, reef managers, scientists, and enthusiasts with a common interest in sharing knowledge on effective propagation techniques. As we are working to finalize a guide to coral reef restoration, we realized that while there are plenty of publications about how to work with branching corals, there's less readily available information about working in the field with the bouldering, plating, and encrusting species. So today's webinar and the information our speakers will share is meant to fill that gap. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be one hour and 30 minutes. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentations. There are two ways you can ask questions. You can use a question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we'll keep track of those for the end of the presentations. Or you can raise your hand during the question and answer session and I will call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar next to your name. And if you're having any technical difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please type a message in the question box and we'll try to help resolve the issue. Next slide. Uh, we'd like to have you tell us a little bit about yourself by answering the following questions. So the first question we have here is, what is the focus region of your work? Okay, so it looks like a majority from the Caribbean, but um, a couple people from other places. Um, and our second question, um, is just a little bit more about what, how you're involved in restoration. Great, so we have a majority of scientists and followed uh, by restoration practitioners. Thanks for participating in the poll. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker, uh, which is Fenor. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today, this morning, this afternoon, and this night for some of you. Uh, happy to see people from everywhere in the world and um, especially from the Caribbean uh, as well, where we 
mainly work. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself. Caitlin already did so well. Thank you very much. The only thing I'm going to say is that I, I'm a certified ecological restoration practitioner, which I it's a um, certificate given by the Society for Ecological Restoration to all of those who uh, practice uh, coral reef restoration. I encourage you to uh, enroll in this uh, certification process to acknowledge and to uh, build upon your experience. Um, I've been working with Coral in the past since 2016. Previous to that, I was in the Seychelles, and through all that time, I also be working in the Maldives and other regions working on coral reef restoration. Uh, next. Um, so today we're talking about how we can propagate massive coral uh, uh, in our projects. And I need to start being the first presenter today by saying why we need to do so. And although branching corals can be considered a pioneering species of a, a reef because of their fast growing uh, um, characteristic, they, they are not the only ones on the reefs, as you may know. Uh, if you go to the Pacific, you have over 120 something species of just acropodids, and, and you have plenty of more species of non branching uh, corals as well. So you, we, we need these massive corals to increase the diversity, and especially as they are the builders of what we call a coral reef in terms of the structure the physical structure. So that's why we need to include them in our efforts. Next. Having said that, where can we source these massive encrusting, submassive corals that because of their slow growth, they're very difficult to uh, go to the, uh, on a natural reef and collect them because you're gonna be maybe damaging or you're gonna be, creating a, 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 a initiating a disease or something like that. So I recommend two main sources for these corals. This was one of the questions that you, some of you asked in a previous pool. And one of those sources for these all called corals of opportunity are artificial structures. Uh, I know in every location, there's gonna be a shipwreck or a pier or a, a concrete block or something like that that is being sunk onto the, on the water and for sure it's going to have some of these massive corals already settling on those and growing on those structures so that's one of the main sources for corals of opportunity especially for growth corals which i commend you to uh, um, collect from there next when you don't have artificial structures but unfortunately you have some disturbances like hurricanes or big storms or unfortunately ship groundings or even then um, uh, uh, anchor damage, this, dam not, uh, this damaged corals can also be a source for those corals of opportunity. You can then take them to the nursery, which I'm just going to cover, and help them to uh, uh, recover and then bring them back to those damaged reef, or you can actually use them for propagating plenty more of those corals using another technique that I'm just going to suggest you guys start doing next so once you collect those corals those massive and encrusting corals tabular corals as well for those slow growing species uh, there are several ways that you can propagate in the first one and the one that i first experienced in the Seychelles were these uh, floating but horizontal nurseries this was just uh, from uh, nets fishing nets recovered uh, uh, from the from the sea, uh, so we were reusing them instead of just throwing them on the garbage. And we built a six by six meters uh, PVC uh, net nursery where we put the corals and we just attach them with cable ties. It, it worked really well for those massive corals and large colonies that we collected from, as I said, from, uh, uh, from wild colonies, some of them. Uh, we collected also from uh, ship grounding, uh, shipwreck, sorry, and piers as well that we found, and also from uh, some of the damages that we found. We put those corals on those nurseries. They work really well as in they help the corals to heal, but as you know, massive corals grow really, really slow. 
and that allows also because of the increased surface area of these uh, nurseries there's a lot of algae so these slow growing corals with that algae they don't do really well together and then you have to spend a lot of time cleaning this nursery so it it worked well for holding the corals but we didn't see that much growth as you will expect and it demanded a lot of work so this is something that you need to consider using and test it to see if it works there is a nice paper that we uh, produce uh, where we discuss how these nurseries become floating ecosystems and how the fish that attracts they help us uh, cleaning those nurseries so that's also uh, something to think about when growing these corals and is using a whole holistic approach and a multi-species approach as well to to increase the efficiency of the cleaning process next once the corals have uh, grown then you can outplant them onto the reef okay and you can use cement you can epoxy you know and this as i said those net nurseries help us uh, uh, help the corals heal and then we outplant them on this reef that we we did an exercise with this uh, massive corals in a shallow water reef rocky reef where we are planting there and we use cement not too much just one that it was pretty much shaping what the coral just so it becomes an extension of the of the coral not just a, a, a cake where it's based the the coral and um, we monitor it through time and as you can see massive corals won't grow that much they will survive of course but they may uh, not do that well in terms of growth and that's something that you need to consider if this technique works for you if you're looking into speeding up the growth there is also a paper that we're uh, preparing now describing how to monitor corals using a low-tech um, uh, technique just using photography next please so they can do really well uh, not that well as the previous one okay they can do really well or a hundred percent survival and of the whole colony but as you can see very very slow growth even for uh, uh, these massive or, and large uh, colonies next and here is where I want to say we had those high survival rates we experienced survival rates of up to 90 percent for uh, these massive corals just by out outplanting them directly onto the reef after one year in the nursery and it was basically because we as you can see here in this slide we use that cement to just uh, mimic the shape of the colony and we didn't have too much left over to allow macroalgae to grow so that's another suggestion that i make when you're out planting these massive corals use less uh, cement that will overgrow uh, the coral or allow the overgrowth of algae on the coral but that just becomes part of the of, of the colony and that way the that slow growth can just start moving back or down you know covering that cement or that epoxy and that definitely increases the success next as i said massive corals grow really really slow and that's something that we experience and uh, if some projects need to produce thousands of corals and massive corals won't just by growing those large colonies won't do it won't be uh, quick enough to to do so to see results and luckily there is a technique called microfragmentation that has uh, shown to speed up up to 50 times the growth of these massive corals developed by dr david bong uh, definitely encourage you to go to the his workshops or learn about it through reading some papers but it, it allows to take one of those large colonies from an artificial reef from a, a, um, a ship grounding or something like that take that colony and just break into very tiny species one square centimeter you know one polyp each of those microfragments and then you can have tens if not hundreds of microfragments from the same colony that can become later single colonies is speeding up the growth and increasing your numbers and then you can take those micro fragments and put them into these cookies uh, it's a very successful technique developed in the uh, in belize and and by fragments of hope and others uh, i use them as well uh, in the maldives and in in, in colombia but um next one 
I am starting to, uh, with my partners, uh, the uh, uh, national parks and, and a project that, and some partners in Providencia Island, we're starting to move away from those cookies because the place where we're working, where we're working um, has a lot of sedimentation. And as you can see in that picture in the top right, uh, that surface area, horizontal fixed colony, it happens with all fish nursery, sorry, that attracts uh, or attracts a lot of uh, sedimentation. We, we start seeing slow growth or a lot of mortality. So we're moving away from those cookies and now we're gonna be using some pyramid shape bases, small ones as well, but it, we expect that uh, they start you know, uh, reducing the amount of sediments that we're gonna see on those uh, nurseries and in that uh, basis. So definitely encourage you to test that and use those uh, proven already techniques for growing those micro fragments or even massive coral, uh, larger fragments as you can see in this picture. Next. And once they grow in the nursery, you can take them back to the reef. We use epoxy. This is the first time that we did it. As you can see, the epoxy is not very good. Uh, I'm just showing here this picture to tell you that you need to work really well on cleaning that area. You're gonna outplant those corals that you're gonna uh, uh, use sufficient enough fixing material. If you have too much, uh, the algae may overgrow there. If you have too little, it's not gonna glue or fix really well. So take that into account when working on this. And because there is low growth, please do all the due diligence to select a good site for uh, placing these uh, micro fragments or even large corals, because otherwise they're gonna be outcompeted by algae. Next. And you can also combine all of those previous techniques. We did so in, in Colombia as well on an artificial reef where we used to enhance uh, the substrate to test if we can combine microfragmentation and put in massive corals to uh, speed up the and different textures on the uh, structure itself itself to speed up coral recruitment and and gluing here in in proof as you can see here and we have seen a larger survival so just gluing really well those corals definitely will help you increase the survival so please take that into account as well next And how did you monitor all of your work? Um, the different, definitely different ways. Uh, standard monitoring techniques will apply definitely. But today, thanks to advancements of technology, I'm using a lot of photogrammetry and structure from motion because it allows me to have a digital archive of the entire area that I can actually see a whole uh, picture and then I can zoom in and see the coral and sometimes depending on the resolution the resolution of the camera even the polyp of, of of the coral that i have outplanted and see how it's doing so here's an example of a, a hundred square meters area that we have been outplanting in san andres colombia next and if i just take one area of those five square meters next and zoom it in you know and then compare it through time i can actually start seeing some progress on that slow growing coral that we have either outplanting or that we've been monitoring here i haven't outplanted massive corals only branching corals but this technique is the beauty of it that it allows me to not only to monitor the outplanting corals but also the other corals in the in the uh, restoration site next if i even zoom in now to 10 square meters each photo i can start seeing now some of the colonies next and next again and see, I can already uh, start by working on the surface area of cover by each of that corals. I can start seeing changes through time. Some growth, some disappear next, and even some appear, you know, through time, as you can see, uh, they all even disappear as well through time. So this is the beauty of this technique. Next, and even if I zoom in to actually the one meter, I can now clearly see the colonies that I'm uh, uh, following 
you know, through time. And if I re replicate this in 2022, in 2023, and can actually track the, the, the growth of, of those colonies. Next. See those branching ones on the on the these massive ones here, Dasporites astreoides, and see how they have changed. So sometimes I can actually see that maybe it's the same percentage; they just have moved in terms of 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 a, a, the the living coral tissue has died in some part but has grown in other parts. So that's the beauty of of this technique. Imagine these are natural colonies, but imagine if they were a, a outplanted colonies. Next. So to finish, to wrap up here, I want to leave you with these five lessons that I have learned so far and that I hope you help, I hope they help you to uh, improve the propagation of massive and submassive corals. First, look for artificial structures or hurricanes or storms or naturally or damaged corals because they are very good sources of donor colonies. That way you don't have to break or damage wild colonies. You can use what has settled on those artificial structures or that are naturally broken and um, you have plenty of material there to use. Then combine and be find best performing structure for growing multiple corals. Just don't take what I, what I have told, uh, told you here and go and apply it. Just test first pilot and then see if it works. There are other techniques that you're gonna see next. So try to see which ones work better for you in terms of sedimentation, of algae overgrowth, and others. Also, try to shape it close to you, uh, uh, fix it properly so that um, the fixing material follows the colony shape to avoid algae overgrowth. Use microfragmentation. Unfortunately, so far, there is, to this day, there is no other technique that can speed growth of massive corals. And finally, start considering using photogrammetry for a cost effective, effective monitoring of your uh, outplanting site. And also to have a digital archive that you can go back anytime and assess your progress. With that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thanks, Fenor. And I just wanted to um, just follow up on what he said. We are gonna keep questions to the end, but we are keeping track of your questions and who they were for. Um, and if we don't get to them, we'll send emails after um, after the webinar. So thank you, and thank you, Fenor. And now we'll pass it over to Andrew. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm Andrew Taylor, and I'm the, the director of Blue Quarter Marine Research, um, based out here in Indonesia, and work as a, rec a restoration practitioner here in Bali. I've been working on coral and other marine uh, habitat restoration project since uh, 2005 and um, I'm going to talk here in this presentation about um, a low-tech field applications for using massive corals. Um, so our, uh, the, here at uh, the restoration project we've been working on, our approaches are purely field-based. Um, so we try and use low-tech, inexpensive methods um, for working in remote settings. Um, so next slide, please. Um, first of all, I'll just give a bit of a background about um, the particular restoration site that um, uh, I'm working on at the moment, and then it'll give a background as to why I chose the techniques for uh, the massive corals. So, uh, I'm working in Nusa Penida, which is a marine park located, as you can see here on the map, in uh, Bali, in Indonesia. It's a tourism area and an area in Indonesia where there's quite a high coastal population. Uh, and also it's an area of extremely high biodiversity there at the bottom of the Indonesian through flow. Um, so we've got a lot of larval input and a lot of biodiversity of coral and other reef organisms. Next slide. Oh, next. Um, so uh, the video that was just playing there on the previous one uh, showed a little bit of, um, showed an image of the can we just go back one slide? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, a video just showing what the uh, what the site looks like. So it's an area of unconsolidated rubble. It, historically, it was a coral reef, um, but then um, obviously there's not very high living percent cover of coral anymore. 
um, and uh, high current area. So um, we needed to figure out how are we going to bring a coral reef back to this area that historically was a reef. Okay, next slide. So I'm doing that in, um, by two methods. First of all, figuring out um, how we can do the structural restoration. So uh, we need to introduce um, structures and provide that substrate and then transplanting um, upon the structures to provide that biological restoration step in order to then stimulate natural recovery of the ecosystem. Next slide. So graphically on this slide here, it's just showing an, a graphical image of first um, install, rebuilding the structure of the rubble area and then outplanting corals upon that structure. All right, next slide. So um, I'm going to talk here about the use of massive corals, so um, Galaxia corals in particular, um, and then go through uh, where we source our parent stock from, um, how we go about fragmenting those corals, and then the use of the structures of the frames, how we position the out plants, and then um, some of the problems we've encountered, some of the successes and um, lessons that we've learned from those. So next slide. So why I chose to use Galaxia and why I'm focusing on Galaxia here um, is because it's, um, as you can see in this video here, uh, this is our adjacent reference reef community to the restoration site we're working on. And it, um, Galaxia is one of the dominant um, species in the uh, reference community. So therefore we wanted to um, also use that in our rest restoration area so that we can bring back the species to the area. Uh, next slide. So in order to source um, parent stock for our restoration site, uh, we used mostly uh, corals of opportunity as uh, Fenor mentioned in the previous um, presentation. So going around to, um, in some of the periphery areas of the rubble fields, we were able to find um, small uh, corals of opportunity that are Galaxia, um, the particular target species that we're um, going after. And so then, um, and bring them into our nursery or transplant directly onto structures. Next slide. The, the other method um, is sourcing parent stock from some of the larger um, colonies that have become dislodged from fishing boat anchors and um, we've caught in some of the colonies that have been tank uh, we've uh, cut out and rescued from fishing nets that have been tangled up. Um, so our parent stock has all been come from corals of opportunity, some smaller fragments as I uh, showed on the previous video, and then some um, from these larger overturned colonies that we're able to then sub fragment down. Next slide. Um, so with some of the smaller corals of opportunity, we, ha uh, we do have a nursery um, at our restoration site, but um, it's mostly used for our branching species. So for the bolder and massive species such as Galaxia. Uh, it's kind of limited use for um, using a, a rope nursery, but um, for, uh, we do use a rope nursery for some of the smaller fragments and grow them out for about six months or so until they're um, a, su a suitable size that can be then fragmented smaller. Next slide. So the coral frames that I meant mentioned um, earlier in the presentation, we're using um, these rebar um, frame structures, so either coated or uncoated. We've been doing um, trials on both coated and uncoated, but that can be a separate presentation. Um, it, we're using uh, rebar frames, which is a popular method for restoration practitioners in this area. Um, so it's been used in Maldives, in um, uh, quite a few different restoration projects here in Indonesia and Philippines, um, Thailand and around the region um, where it's able to um, provide a bit of a structure that allows the, um, the currents to still pass through um, while having that stable substrate that we can attach corals on that's up above the shifting unconsolidated rubble. Um, so then um, with the fragments, uh, we transplant directly onto those uh, frames. So next slide. With the, um, for fragmenting, we do, as I mentioned earlier, we do all of our um, 
uh, all of our work in the field. So it's uh, very low tech. We don't have access to onshore lab facilities or band saws or precision tools or anything because we are in a remote setting. Um, so we do our fragmenting in the field, either underwater or um, on the boat and then um, in baskets and at the site. So uh, since we're uh, fragmenting underwater which, um, with massive corals, we're not really able to do micro fragmenting where it's sort of macro fragmenting or larger pieces um, that we have, uh, as you can see on the next slide then. So the next slide shows that um, our fragments are a lot larger than what would be used in a lab setting or an aquarium setting. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, so for attachment of um, uh, attachment of uh, egg galaxia or um, boulder corals onto um, onto frames. Uh, we use cable ties. We have tried a different attachment methods such as um, epoxy and um, marine cement, but because we're working in such really strong um, currents, we need something that attaches immediately. So we have found that uh, cable ties actually, they do uh, work quite well. So next slide. And then the positioning of the um, fragments on the frame. Uh, over time, these uh, the the fragments then create the larger coral heads as they grow beyond the confines of the frame. And next slide. So this slide shows um, that frame that uh, I showed a few other photos of there um, that we had transplanted um, corals of opportunity fragments upon. Um, and then after three years, we were starting to see um, yeah, some growth. We're starting to see a bit of fusion, larger colonies forming. Um, however, uh, it wasn't really the results we were hoping for. Um, and uh, so that's one of the problems with using corals of opportunity is because um, it, it, uh, our corals of opportunity are not necessarily coming from the same parent stock. So as we're placing them on a, a frame that's one meter square together, um, there may or may not be fusion depending on whether they were fragments from the same parent stock or not. Um, so it was a learning experience um, from that particular frame where we realized, okay, we need to be a lot more careful with, um, with where our parent stock is coming from so that uh, one frame is all from the same parent. So we use fragments from the same parent now, which I'll show on the next slide. Um, but uh, this, this particular method did have some secondary benefits of stabilizing the adjacent area. So then we adapted um, the technique a bit and started uh, using a mesh over top of the rebar frames. And that allowed these, um, uh, the uh, galaxia corals to then start spreading uh, um, laterally and start um, fusing and joining along with their neighboring fragments a lot more easy. Um, next slide. So um, that's a zoomed out version there of the frame with, um, with the mesh on top. So all the fragments then, once we started using um, fragments that were all from the same parent uh, on the, and using a mesh style, um, a mesh over top of the frame, uh, we were finding uh, fusion a lot quicker. So there's after two and a half years, um, that same frame is completely covered and we're starting to actually get a um, more full, complete coral head forming um, that then, um, unlike the previous example there. Uh, so uh, improving the technique a little bit as we go to figure out which, um, which methods are working, which methods aren't. Um, and then we're all, uh, so this example that I've given in this presentation is all um, through the use of boulder coral galaxia, but we are starting to um, use similar techniques for some of the um, folio species like Echinophora um, and as well as other boulder corals like Goniophora as well. And last slide then. Oh, the next slide is, um, yeah, so for, uh, that's been quite a brief overview of um, the particular method um, that we're using here in Indonesia at our restoration project in order to try and um, bring boulder corals or these uh, massive corals, the galaxia, into the restoration site 
uh, because we, we do use branching corals and some folio species, um, but we are wanting to bring in those bolder um, species as well to get the, uh, to get the diversity of, the, of our reference community. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat there on the webinar um, or else email me directly and I'm happy to chat and share more photos, videos, and chat one-on-one -on -one with anyone who has any questions or wants to help out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. And now we'll pass it over to Sam. Thanks very much. Good morning, my name is Sam Burrell. I represent Coral Restoration Foundation. I am a Senior Reef Restoration Associate Primarily, I manage the boulder coral sections of our in-water nurseries, and appropriately today, I'm going to discuss some of the methods we use to propagate these corals in water in our nurseries. Next slide. So, brief background on Florida's coral reef. It is the only coral reef in the continental United States. It stretches about 350 miles long. If you scrunched it all together, it would be about 260 miles of continuous reef. Um, as you can imagine, many of the humans rely on the coral reef for their livelihood through tourism industry, but of course, the vast amounts of marine species that rely on a healthy coral reef um, spread throughout the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, especially. Um, over the years, unfortunately, the coral reef has declined in both coral abundance and species diversity uh, to the point where it's become apparent that restoration practitioners have to step in and intervene. Um, to date, many of the restoration Techniques have involved branching acropid species, such as acropid palmata or acropid cervicornis. But as coral cover and coral diversity continues to decline, it's become apparent that we have to start restoring additional species, um, such as boulder corals. And that's sort of where these boulder corals fit in here. Um, Mission Iconic Reefs is a massive investment in large scale restoration that was launched by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, CRF is one of the restoration practitioners that's partnered with NOAA on this project. It focuses on seven key reefs that are spread throughout the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, we are currently in phase one of this project, which uh, primarily starts with restoring Elkhorn corals, Acropora palmata, but they're going to start phasing in other corals. So CRF has had to develop um, quick and easy in-water methods for propagating boulder corals so that we're ready to restore plenty of them back onto the reef. Our methods are relatively simple, so they're cost effective. I would say they're quite scalable to your needs as restoration practitioners, and they can all be completed in water on scuba once the initial setup is complete, which is really cool. Uh, next slide. So some brief background on how we uh, receive these corals, just like uh, my fellow panelists, CRF acquired these corals as corals of opportunity. So again, these are corals that broke off the reef, whether that's due to anchoring issues or storm surge from hurricanes. Um, we went out, the bulk of the collections took place between 2016 and 2018, but started as early as 2013. Uh, that's Orbicella annularis there at the top, Orbicella fabulata down there at the bottom. CRF went out and collected 36 individual putative colonies from each of those species and brought them back to our in-water nursery before we were ready to begin the propagation. Next slide. So when we were ready, we brought them back on land. So this is really the only land phase here, this whole process. And we cored these corals, these parent colonies. So in that first picture there, that is a drill press equipped with a two and a half centimeter diamond coated circular core bit. That cores down into the coral about three to five centimeters deep. You get a lot of skeleton and then about a half centimeter of tissue. You can trim the excess skeleton off using a table saw or other different kinds of saws and that leaves you with a nice flat disc there in that bottom picture with, again, about a half centimeter of, of live tissue on top. Then we mounted them to three by two inch PVC cards that were pre-drilled and then attached with mono um, to, go, to go hang in our nursery, but we attached the discs with a small amount of super glue and then a small band of marine epoxy around the base of the skeleton, and that allows the tissue to grow over the skeleton, down over the marine epoxy, and then start skirting its tissue to the edges of the cards before we put them in our nursery on structures made of PVC and fiberglass that we call coral trees. Next slide. 
So this left picture here is the first design of our boulder tree. It really mimics the trees that we had set up for the acroporid branching species that we had in our nursery. But there were some issues with this design. You can see um, kind of on the right hand side of that picture there, these cards uh, due to the surface area and the weight of the cards, they would sort of flap around and hit each other and the, the corals were actually falling off. Sometimes we'd lose cards and they'd drop down into the sand. So um, also the vertical nature of how the, the orientation of the cards didn't really allow for much light penetration. So they weren't growing super quick. Um, so eventually we got a couple of design iterations later and we had that, that's our current design on the right. So right away you can notice it's a horizontal orientation of these corals. So it allows maximum light penetration and we find that's really the best way for these to grow as quickly as possible. That tree design on the right has trays that are inserted onto fiberglass rods, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, right now I wanna talk about broodstock, which is what I'll be referring to. Those were the original parent colonies that we got um, as corals of opportunity that have been fragged over a few successive generations to really make them as flat as possible. Uh, so next slide. So this is broodstock, again, that's the parent colonies. That top picture there is broodstock that has fully skirted its tissues to the edges of those PVC cards. That takes about a year in general for those to uh, fully skirt to the edges of the cards. Um, again, I mentioned you want it to be incredibly flat because that allows you to easily fragment into both new generations of broodstock, but also into outplant ready plugs. Um, that allows them to grow the quickest possible. If you don't make them flat, they become quite vertical and bulbous, almost like a golf ball shape, and it becomes incredibly difficult to actually frag these in water. So the flatter, the better. I can't stress that enough. Um, those two broodstock at the top have actually fused. So when you're ready to fragment these, you can break them apart, and then you flex the card underneath the broodstock. The broodstock simply pops right off the card. And then we take um, diagonal husky cutters. That's the tool we use for actually all our in-water fragmentation across the board for all corals. We um, will first fragment the broodstock so that we're maintaining healthy populations of broodstock and we don't lose any genotypes or um, colonies. And that middle picture there is freshly fragged broodstock. That's as flat as possible. It's placed on the center of those PVC cards with, again, marine epoxy that's smooth around the edges, and that again allows that tissue to skirt over the marine epoxy and to the edges of the cards, again, taking about a year. That bottom picture is our tray design. It is half inch PVC pipes that are um, in a nine and a half by 12 and a half inch uh, sort of area there. They have hardware cloth mesh that is zip tied on top of the PVC tray. The two pipes in the middle of the tray are left open so that we can slide them onto the fiberglass rods, and then we have 12 PVC cards that are zip tied down to the mesh where we can um, put the new brood stock on top of those. I would recommend setting these trays up prior to entering the water so you don't lose much time once you're ready to actually go in water and fragment. Uh, we typically have two of those trays per tree, so that's 24 pieces of brood stock per tree. And the remaining tissue you can then use to fragment into outplant plugs. Next slide. So these are outplant plugs. Um, again, once you've already fragged out the broodstock, it's time to make your plugs. So again, we use those diagonal husky cutters and the remaining tissue you can just simply cut into one to two centimeter size pieces. That is the same tray design with the same mesh, but now it has aragonite aquarium plugs. It's two and a half centimeter in diameter plugs um, that have stems. So it's a, it's a disc on top with a stem beneath and those stems can actually just be inserted straight into the hardware cloth mesh. It's an array of seven by 10 plugs, so that's 70 plugs per tray. We typically have four of those trays per tree, so that's, we try to have 280 plugs depending on the available tissue that we have. Um, so again, you create one to two centimeter fragments out of the remaining tissue. You take about a fingernail size amount of marine epoxy and put it in the center of those plugs, and then you can take those fragments, those little bits of coral, and squish them down on top of that marine epoxy smooth them out. Those outplant pugs take about nine to 12 months to skirt their tissue to the edge of the plugs before they become outplant ready and before we return them back to the reef. That bottom picture there is uh, myself underwater. We are also starting to work with other novel coral species such as Montastria cavernosa in that picture. And you can use various sizes of plugs. It doesn't have to be the two and a half centimeter ones. Um, it's the same tray design though in that bottom picture. Uh, but we find that for Orbicell, those plugs work best for outplanting. Next slide. 
So this is a nice graphic of our boulder coral tree uh, sort of broken down for you guys. At the top there, that's two sets of uh, styrofoam floats that keep the tree upright in the water. The tree itself is composed of the trunk, if you will, is made of a uh, five foot long PVC pipe that's one inch. It is um, joined together with PVC joints at the top and bolted in top and bottom so that it's a nice narrow rectangle shape. And then it has a 1200 pound piece of monofilament fishing line that keeps it uh, stable in the water column. Um, it is anchored to a duckbill earth anchor, which buried in the sand so the tree doesn't go anywhere. Again, that's six trays per tree. You can see at the top there, the broodstock. Uh, you want the broodstock at the top because that allows maximum light penetration. So you're, again, maintaining that healthy broodstock. And then you can put the um, outplant plugs beneath. Those trays slide off of uh, three sets of parallel fiberglass rods that are about three feet long. And they're separated from each other with about two feet of headroom um, in between each section of, of tray there. Um, and when you're ready, you just pop the trays off and bring them down um, to the sand to fragment or whatever, you, whatever you're doing at that point. Um, I want to mention that for maintenance of these trees is really um, cleaning is, is the biggest thing here. So uh, we clean pretty often. We try to get out and clean these trays at least once a month. If you're keeping up with the cleaning, uh, you don't have to really worry about more encrusting organisms such as fire coral or bivalves that like to grow. As you can imagine, marine species, uh, they'll use any type of available space on these trees to grow under the mesh and on the cards themselves. When you have fresh brood stock, they like to grow on the available space on the cards and the plugs as well. So we use dirt and grout brushes um, typically to clean, but we also can use chisels to remove some of the uh, more encrusting organisms if it gets to that point. Again, if you're keeping up with it, hopefully all you need to do is take some light brushing once in a while, but um, we recommend that you depending on how many trees you have or trays, uh, we like to get out there and clean the trays at least once a month so that we're making sure that they're growing as efficiently as possible. Um, if you are doing that, you will yield 280 plugs per tree I mentioned. So we have 36 trees, 36 colonies per species of Orbicella. So that's 72 in total at 280 plugs per tree. We can generate somewhere around 20,000 outplant plugs per year that we can then return to the reef um, based on the proper maintenance of these trees. Next slide, please. So now I just briefly want to talk about outplanting. So when they're ready to go and they've skirted their tissue to the edge of the plugs, that is the perfect time to outplant them. Uh, you simply remove the tray from the tree. You can bring it out to the reef. The plugs will stay put until you're ready to take them off and put them um, onto the coral, uh, dead coral head, excuse me. So that, that top left picture there is a um, dead coral head, that's where we typically plant these orbicellas. Uh, we used to use a Nemo drill to drill into these coral heads and then insert the plugs, but that really created a bottleneck. Um, there could, it was expensive, number one, but also uh, only one person could operate the drill at a time, so uh, other people were sort of just waiting around for that person to get done. Um, so now we use the back of a hammer, um, just a simple hammer that you can scrape away and chisel away the skeleton to reveal nice white limestone underneath. And then you, when you're ready, you put marine epoxy down and then you can take those plugs off the tray one by one. Again, using those diagonal husky cutters, you can pop the stem off the back of those discs. And then the, it's just a flat disc that you can push down into the marine epoxy. Um, the goal here in the bottom left picture is for those fresh uh, outplant plugs to skirt their tissue again over the plugs down onto the coral head and eventually fuse because those will be in a monogenetic cluster at this point. Next slide. So I want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, for any additional information on this, a lot of these information, such as building trees, can be found in our white paper on Orbicella um, methods for large-scale restoration. You can find that at www.coralrestoration.org slash white papers. I want to thank Coral Restoration Foundation, the Coral Reef Consortium, and of course the Reef Resilience Network for having me. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. And finally, we'll hear from Shai. Hello, everybody. I hope you see me. No? Okay. No? No, it's okay. Okay, nice. Shalom from Israel. Um, Shai Shafir. I'm working in uh, Oranim College of Education, but my main coral activity for the last uh, more than 20 years is with Professor Buki Renkevich, from IOLR in Israel. So, and we worked all around the world. And I will um, 
focus on two main uh, area basic uh, restoration and also practical restoration next next please okay mm -hmm. so when we are talking about active restoration and we are all dealing with active restoration uh, most of us are doing in two phase one phase we are cultivating all the corals in nursery and I have developed uh, what we call the midwater uh, coral nursery, floating midwater coral nursery, uh, that we grow hundreds of thousands and uh, maybe more than that uh, corals over the years. And the second phase is just to plant them in an uh, area that needed to be uh, planted in Israel, in Israel and around the world. Sorry. Yes, next. So when we are talking about corals, some basic, you know, you know all about corals, but sometimes we are forgetting that corals are mainly a very thin tissue. And I put a glove on my hand to mimic the, the tissue of the coral, which is the glove itself. All the beneath, all the skeleton is uh, just a skeleton, it's dead. The most important area of the corals is just this thin layer of skeleton that's around my hand and that's all what it is and with this we have to take care of and with this we have to deal with next now we all talk about cause of impunity and i'm very happy that everybody is focused on this it's a very good idea and no no more words about it next Now, one of the uh, things about corals that are in, in the basic of evolution, it's their ability to regenerate. And their regeneration is very, very uh, basic and done well. And when you're putting a coral on the surface, most of the corals, not all of them, but most of them, deposit um, skeleton and tissue horizontal on the substrate. And by doing that, they are self-attaching themselves to the substrate. And this is a very important phase for the corals to grow on, because then they can grow on almost any substrates and attach themselves. Uh, after you're gluing them or superglue or epoxy, but the self-attachment is reinforcing this attachment. Yes, next. Now the substrate, what you are, you can plant on, is any substrate, and we are mostly focusing on substrate that you can find locally. You don't need to buy them. You don't. You usually using uh, uh, what you call in recycling materials. This substrate that I'm holding here with uh, Cifastre on it, it just uh, from a factory uh, of uh, uh, plastic, and this is the leftovers of the plastic. Uh, on the right, you can see just pipes, pipes, plastic pipes that they were cut into pieces and uh, they were attached to the uh, to this net. Um, overall, uh, try to think about low tech, and and when we are talking about low tech, is to find the materials locally. What in the local area you can find those materials in, uh, uh, and then use them for the best uh, use. Next. So there are all kinds of uh, non-branching corals. And if you are taking what we're calling a leaf-like coral cone like this pavona, uh, you can uh, glue them to this uh, small pin uh, over super glue and different uh, sizes, or you can glue them next to a surface. Next. And then when you are gluing them to a surface, each one up, one back, please. And when you are gluing them to the surface, each of them deposit this uh, horizontal tissue. And since they are, since they are a genetic identity, because they are from the same colony, they create a, a big surface all over this disc which can be all this from plastic or a tile from uh, cement or from ceramic. 
and this you are creating an area of corals that compete with the macroalgae. Next. When you're taking more massive and crusting corals like Cifastrea, it's a bit difficult to cut it. And the next video is showing you how we do it. Next. Preparing small coral nubbins from the massive coral Cifastrea is a major challenge. Coral colonies only have live tissue on their surface area. Elad uses a four and a half inch angle grinder disc to saw the coral colony into five centimeter slices without reaching the coral's live tissue. Skeleton remains are removed under running seawater. The massive colony is placed upside down with the delicate tissue resting on a wet paper towel. Coral colony slices are separated using a chisel and a hammer and are placed under running seawater. The dead coral skeleton is sawed out, leaving a small surface area of live coral tissue. The flat coral pieces are washed under running seawater. An electronic cutter is used to prune small nubbins ready to be glued on a suitable surface. So you can see this next, please. So you can see this small uh, nubbin, small, you're calling microfragment. We call it a nubbin. It's a nice word for uh, a seed of a corn or corn. And uh, you can see that from each coral, any corals almost, uh, you can use and do this fragmentation and make small nubbins and glue them to this uh, plastic tips or whatever. And uh, then they will grow. A lot of patience you need, but uh, they're growing slowly. But uh, after a while, one year, uh, one and a half year, they are forming a small colony that it can then attach to the reef. Now we like to use this for a few different reasons. First, you can see very well the uh, attached, uh, uh, the, the, the self-attached uh, um, tissue. But secondly, you can uh, drill them into the reef in 3D dimension. You, uh, the reef is not only two dimension. You don't only can uh, uh, glue it from the top. You can glue them and drill from the side and attach all sides of the reef to do this fragment, to do this restoration. Next. So this is the small fragments of the fabia, what we uh, I'm used to call, and it can be also one polyps or half a polyps and it will still regenerate very nicely. Next. And become a very nice cores, as you can see. Next. Now, uh, we did the same in Jamaica with this poetess, and uh, very few, uh, you see about 20 polyps, of this pruritus on this pin, and they grew afterwards, and we just drill them into the bare reef, and uh, they will grow afterwards very nicely. Pruritus can be handled the same as we did with the Cifastrea. Next. And uh, we use the same technique to do it in, on many, many uh, fragments, or so many, many nubbins, in Israel from the Poitis lubata and uh, glue them afterwards to those pins. Next. 
and grow them afterwards in the nursery in the Red Sea that uh, uh, we did. Something interesting, next, next please. Something interesting about uh, corals and poritas in general, uh, that they are uh, also a hub for other creatures. So when you are transplanting, you are not just transplanting the corals, you're also transplanting all the other organisms that settle on these corals, and poritas are uh, very good candidates for all kinds of worms and scallops on or other animals that uh, try to grow into his uh, kind of soft uh, skeleton. So uh, you can see the, especially from the Holy Land, the Christmas tree that growing on the, this uh, uh, corals of uh, Poitus. Next. Now we use also warp nursery. And I think warp nursery is the part of the future of active restoration uh, for many, many reasons. And uh, we'll see in the movie, and I will talk through the movie. So do it next and we'll talk, uh, I'll talk through the movie. So it's very easy to, to do it and everybody can very low tech, very uh, low costing materials. Uh, this is in American Samoa, the local people from the village uh, are doing this uh, coral nursery very, um, you have to teach them uh, five minutes and uh, you can insert into the uh, rope any kind of corals. Now, uh, it's very, very, I think it's one of the most low uh, costing uh, uh, technique to grow corals and the way afterwards to grow them and to attach them afterwards to the reef, this is the main, uh, the main one of the main uh, advantage because you can uh, carry a whole nursery of corals, of a uh, rope nursery to their sites and it can be rubbles uh, as we saw in the previous lectures and it can be on reefs that you clean the algae before it and uh, you can see here the nursery floating in the water and uh, in, in very uh, quick time because uh, time is money and the material is money and i think the uh, most challenging uh, things for us is how to do it as low cost as possible so this is one of the most important things next now something general about uh, active restoration and it doesn't matter any as, as, uh, as any course we are talking branching or non-branching the same idea because uh, we are focusing now in the catastrophe that we are in charge of it all the bleaching it's our fault so it's our responsibility also to um, restore actively now we have to to do it uh, um, smartly and since we are changing evolution very quickly or we are changing con condition very quickly we have i think to my opinion to take corals that are already adapted to the new situation corals that survive bleaching are the candidate for the nursery not to take just anyone not just uh, uh, everything but we need to choose now because if we want uh, corals in the future we have to help them to uh, to push them a little bit towards uh, their uh, their ability to be uh, to be resistant to bleaching next and i want to emphasize so we are we have the corals have a very high most corals have the high ability of regenerate and it's we have to take it into consideration nappings what we're calling um, micro fragments if you're calling or fragment can be made for most corals i we are uh, in our uh, nursery around the world i think we deal in more than 100 species of corals and with those examples here i think it's even more uh, 
we have to think about uh, allowing or letting the coral to deposit their skeleton and uh, self-attached to the surface. And we have to think about the materials that we are uh, putting the corals on in the nurseries. So it will be easier for us afterwards to attach them to uh, the reef and restore the reef. Uh, next. So thank you very much. And I want to uh, wish you from the Holy Land uh, to those who are celebrating a very Merry Christmas. And thanks to Aladdin, Professor Booker and Kevin. Thanks, Guy. Um, so I want to thank all our speakers. Um, those were really great presentations. And now we'll move on to the question and answer session. Just a reminder that you can type um, your questions into the question box and I will read them for you, or you can raise your hand. We already have a ton of questions. <laughs> So I don't know that we'll get through them all, but we'll do our best. Um, so let's go ahead and start. I, I'm going to start with some of the more general questions and then we can do, actually, I want to just ask all the speakers to turn their cameras back on so we can see everybody. Thanks. Um, okay, so a couple of general questions. Um, What is the annual operating cost for your different methods? That's probably a really hard one to answer just off the cuff, but just maybe if people can give a general sense of what this type of restoration costs. No, too complicated. <laughs> I'm happy to answer in terms of um, our project. Um, so uh, the way we, we operate it is, um, uh, so per frame, uh, they cost about uh, 35 US dollars for me to get the frames um, made here on the island and welded and with rebar and coated. Um, and then we partner with our dive center um, for going out. So um, for fuels to get out to the site, um, it costs us, it's around $100 um, per trip. And so we try and um, we try and get a whole bunch of frames and everything together so that we do it in um, sort of work weeks where we'll do one week out and we'll do just five days out and install a whole bunch of frames, get a whole bunch of volunteers and go out transplanting. So um, we're able to do it actually relatively inexpensively because we do use um, volunteers um, for helpers. Uh, so dive instructors that are having days off, dive masters, um, uh, uh, fun divers or uh, tourists that are on the island that just want to help out. Um, so our staffing costs are quite low that way um, because we operate volunteers. Um, and then the actual methods themselves, like $35 for a frame, um, a bunch of tools and then fuel for the boats. So we're actually able to operate really inexpensively. I, I wish to add uh, an idea that we uh, try to use many in several places. Uh, and uh, now in Mauritius, they are trying to uh, collaborate with hotels and to um, use to tourists. Uh, with, with the COVID, uh, now it's, uh, it's a bit of a problem. But to use tourists as uh, adopt the coral. And since uh, the technique is very low tech, you don't. Uh, you can any. Uh, you can teach everybody how to do it with the right guidance. Uh, tourists are participating in those days of making uh, corals, and the hotels is providing all the rest for the nursery. And um, then it's uh, no cost at all, even. Thanks. Um, we have a lot of questions about um, okay. Fish predation. So uh, there were a couple about, are you seeing a lot of fish predation um, in the various places with corals both in the nursery and um, when they're outplanted? And do you have any methods to help prevent that? Is, it, is that I, just... <laughs> Maybe that's just a Florida block problem. <laughs> I was going to just quickly say um, we started out planning 
these boulder corals in 2018. And we found that more than disease or anything else, predation is the number one factor that contributes to the mortality of these before they can reach the one year monitoring phase. So um, as far as mitigating that, we're kind of still working through that because it is relatively new for us, but um, that is more so once we outplant them, we don't see much predation in the nursery actually, which is positive, but I think the parrotfish are the, the key uh, fish that are eating these corals. So. Or do you see predation in the Caribbean? Uh, um, not for the massive corals, we don't see that much predation. Definitely for the branching corals, the fireworms is a worst enemy. I won't say, I won't blame the parrotfish for eating our corals. That's, that's what they do, you know. Uh, um, but uh, it, it, it definitely location based. In the Maldives, we don't see predation. In the Seychelles, we had a problem with predation, uh, also for branching corals with the crown of thorns, not for the massive corals. And in Colombia, uh, so far, not with the massive corals either, we don't see predation. For us, our main problems are in the Caribbean, macroalgae and sedimentation. Those are the worst ones. In the Maldives, it's actually a heat temperatures, okay? Uh, sorry, warm ocean temperatures, too, too warm. And in the Seychelles, it's just a uh, sedimentation as well. So it's very uh, based location, but luckily no predation for us. We had predation of uh, the massive corals uh, that they were growing in the nursery and they came very, um, with a very fat tissue, uh, that the very good condition. And the parrot fish just ate them like snakes uh, all, uh, all over. And it, it was only in the beginning. Only the beginning. So you are going back to this area and you replace them. And when you replace them and the whole popula population of the, of the fish is, is coming and uh, taking this area, then the parrot fish is uh, not coming uh, so often. In the beginning, in the start, when the reef is bare and uh, those uh, uh, cores are out, uh, you can see them very well. I don't know. Uh, then it's a problem. Later on, less problem. We have a problem with the snail drupella. Uh, I don't know if you know this drupella. Uh, also in, in the nursery and a little bit less in the area of plantation, but in the area, this is the, our main goal of, uh, of collecting and collecting. We are just collecting the, uh, those snails, the big ones. The small ones, as I mentioned before, you the the nursery are becoming uh, a kind of a natural reef and the uh, fish are coming and the uh, other creatures are coming and they are taking care of cleaning the corals and kept keeping the nursery as a as a kind of a mini ecosystem which is very balanced now we're having a lot of um, issues with the drupella snails as well, especially for the acroporas. Um, they seem to think it's a bit of a buffet that I set out for them. Um, so it, about uh, once a month or so, I have our interns and students go out and um, do drupella removals from our um, from our outplant site. Okay, and then there was also a bunch of questions about fouling. So for Andrew, um, some questions about what kind of material was the mesh made of? Um, do you think they would work in areas with fouling? Or if you have it, um, sort of how often do you have to clean? And Yeah, um, so I tried with uh, two different types of meshes. Um, I tried with a mesh that was uh, just uh, made out of uh, thin, thin steel, um, so a metal Kind of chicken wire um, and I found that that one actually degraded quite quickly and so it didn't actually stay on long enough for the um, for the coral to spread across and attach so then I started using a mesh that was um, like a coated um, a coated steel mesh so it is like a plastic dipped um, so it does have um, it's a bit of plastic on top of metal um, and that seems to stay longer unfortunately we don't like introducing more plastic into the environment, but um, it seems to be the 
the product that lasts long enough for the coral to actually attach its skeleton onto. Um, so that's what I've started using is uh, um, yeah, the steel mesh that's uh, coated in plastic. And uh, in terms of fouling, uh, in our area, we don't, uh, we are kind of lucky because we have um, such strong currents, really good water quality. Um, and so uh, we do from time to time get algae outbreaks, especially right now it's monsoon season here. So we are getting some algae blooms um, from time to time, but uh, there is a really good herbivore population in the area. And so it's keeping it in check. Um, so I have had some fouling of the mesh with um, some of the sort of uh, uh, filamentous algaes and we, we've gone and scraped it off and it seems to um, do the trick. Okay and for Sam there was a question about the horizontal cards and whether they require a lot of maintenance um, and same thing like do they attract a lot of biofouling? Yeah definitely um, and that's you know why I, I tried to stress that we if you clean them properly initially you don't let them build up with that biofouling. Um, once you leave them for a couple months or something like that, for whatever reason, maybe you just can't get out in the water for a while, um, the, especially the bivalves will, will try to grow under the mesh itself, but the cards especially. Um, typically, we see lots of different filamentous algae as well growing on the cards, little encrusting organisms, encrusting algae. Um, so the, the cards in the broodstock is really the the most precious part of the tree so you have to be incredibly careful when you're cleaning those um, we have resorted to using really tiny brushes such as toothbrushes just to make sure that we're not scrubbing any of the tissue when we're cleaning around the cards um, but eventually the coral does a pretty good job of actually um, just spreading its skeleton and kind of combating that algae to the point where um, once you have it start growing at those initial phases it will actually do a pretty good job of just growing on its own uh, although we do like to get out there and help it along the way as well. Um, and just be careful if you do use this method, uh, if you flex the card at all and you've recently put the broodstock on there, the broodstock will just pop right off the card. So you have to make sure that whoever's doing the cleaning is properly trained for that too. Great, thanks. Um, there were some questions about uh, sort of growth rates, like with using zip ties, how quickly does a coral grow over that? How quickly does it skirt over edges? And then has anyone observed their corals once they've gotten bigger actually spawning in the field? If, if I may about, uh, comment on, on the growth, definitely uh, we, we started using cable ties to attach the corals on the mesh. And even on, on the outplanting site as well, sometimes uh, attaching the fragments, you know, directly onto the reef as well with cable ties. I don't like them, but as, as Andrew said, it works really well in, 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 in some areas where you need to do it quickly. And if you do it properly, it will set it. It, it, it won't allow the coral to move. So in a matter of three months, you start seeing already the coral overgrowing, you know, if, if the coral is fixed, properly fixed, so it won't move. So you kind of start spending the energy just growing. In three months, you start seeing how the little, a few millimeters of space in the cable tight, it just gets overgrown by the coral. Just recommendation, don't leave on the cable tight, don't leave that little excess, you know, tight, just cut it as close as you can, otherwise the algae will just settle there and then you have overgrown of algae there. Um, <clears throat> I wish to comment on several things, please. Uh, I did research uh, 12, 12, 15 years ago about using anti-fouling on the net itself because my nursery was attached to a, uh, next to a, what we call a, a fish, fish net, a, a farm, a farm of fish, and the nets were with all of those anti-fouling. We use the same anti-fouling on our nets of the corals, and we found out it's very helpful. It's harmful to the corals, so you can't put them on the plastic itself. But if you put it on the net, on the plastic net that we are using, and I, sorry to say, but plastic is the 
uh, best materials for growing corals where we tried many other stuff uh, and the small amount of plastic that we are putting in the uh, back to the ocean come on it's it's really uh, we are putting much more corals we are doing good to nature we have to remember that and uh, when we we put this very uh, inside the net inside the net so it's influenced this area also around there will very uh, little mortality and there uh, were no uh, no fouling on the on the course itself it was very helpful so to think about other materials and uh, look out my anti-fouling and my name and you find this article about it and other things about uh, sedimentation uh, that what we found uh, we found that just putting the fresh corals uh, the new seedling upside down upside uh, horizontal uh, horizontal it's better for the coral to go to self-attach because the dimension that's grow and falling is falling afterwards down uh, down and not settle on the surface so even uh, putting a little bit aside the the uh, plates that you are growing it will reduce this uh, accumulation of sedimentation. And third thing, something we all do, but we don't maybe know the real uh, reason for it. Uh, when you are growing in nursery that are not fixed to the ground, and most of us are growing in nursery that are floating, coral need to change the water environment all the time. So good currents are doing it. But if you are growing it on the nursery that float in the water, the waves are doing it also. And all the time, the corals see new water. And they can change better oxygen, uh, better nutrients, better plankton to eat, and uh, all the waste products outside. And the movement of the coral is making them grow faster. Uh, our corals are growing one and a half to two times faster in this mid-water coral nursery than the regular corals on fixed nursery. And uh, this movement, I think, you know, it's a, uh, I, we think that this movement is part of the solution and part of the benefit of growing corals. Does anyone observe spawning with corals they've outpainted? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet either, yeah. <laughs> um, has anyone? We had it for, with the branching corals. With the branching corals, we had it a lot. But uh, massive. It's taking next next stage uh, uh, life cycle. Has anyone been working on translocation for mesophotic zone corals or octocorals? Um, I have been using some octocorals in uh, like uh, for substrate stabilization. So um, in some of the areas of rubble, what we're trying to do is um, uh, stop the rubble from moving long enough so that then we'll get settlement, um, like natural settlement taking place in the area. And so I roll out um, uh, mesh across rubble areas and then we um, we seed it with sponge and soft corals. So zinnia is what we're using um, because it kind of grows like a weed, um, an octocoral, uh, soft coral zinnia, um, and it helps create a bit of a carpet across the rubble and stabilize that rubble. So um, it's quite easy to transplant um, or, or translocate uh, zinnia corals because they take hold of just about anything. Um, so uh, yeah, for that, usually what I do is um, either take a, a slice of zinnia from a parent um, and then uh, put it into the rubble or else just take pieces of rubble where zinnia is growing and um, attach it into the mesh that we've rolled out. Uh, so that is one method that we're working on. Great. Um, do you have any experience, Andrew, this one, I think? You obviously do, but anyone else have experience with outpinning massive corals on engineered structures and not just old coral heads? 
And then sort of related to that, specific to Andrew, how do you attach your frames to the substrate? Um, uh, does someone else want to go uh, first before? Okay, so I, I just show actually um, we use this. Well, first there was a model uh, a structure to enhance the substrate. Uh, it's a modular system that each brick has a different textures, and the whole goal is to assess uh, if we can uh, increase coral recruitment on those just my, by diversifying the texture of each brick, the modular system and the design of, of it with currents and model and all of those oceanographic stuff. And then um, we also use microfragments and corals attached to the structures to see if in the areas where we have placed them, we see more coral recruitment compared to the areas that we didn't uh, have um, uh, corals. So in the whole structure, we we place corals in one side of the structure, and the other side we didn't put it. Same on the other side, and we try to see if we see some enhancement on coral recruitment. Uh, attaching because of our structure is vertical. It was very difficult to attach the corals, you know, on those vertical structures. So it took a little bit of time. Epoxy worked really well on those artificial structures because cement. You know, in a vertical structure, one it won't settle. Um, so epoxy work really well. Just well uh, underwater, mix it properly, put it into the fragment, and attach it and hold it there for quite a while. And it helped that the texture of the structure of the base wasn't as smooth. It was actually rough. So for those artificial structures, it worked really well. Micro fragments or large colonies. Just be careful of on the uh, uh, <laughs> fixing material that you're using. We we uh, we have an uh, what we calling out the ship and reef that was planted in our head, and they drill in the cement that build this artificial reef. They drill already out uh, uh, on land the holes for those things. So all we need to come was to come and just plug it in and glue it a little bit, and it was wonderful. Yeah, uh, CRF has been trialing some. Boulder domes, we call them. So we initially, uh, they're, they're basically, I wish I had a picture, but they're domes that have a bunch of holes where we can actually just insert the plugs into them. Um, that way you can allow, you know, volunteers could go out and actually outplant these plugs directly into the domes themselves, again, using rain epoxy. Um, so we've tried some cement domes and then some, uh, we're trialing some 3D engineered structures as well. Um, so stay tuned on that. I'll hopefully have more info once we try to outplant those uh, in mass. So. To answer the um, part about um, how we anchor our structures in, um, so uh, that is kind of the interesting things. Um, I've tried a few different methods. Uh, the design of our frames, um, I have them go 30 centimeters, so about a foot um, for the Americans, um, and into the rubble substrate. Uh, so we hammer the um, the frames down in, so they're about 30 centimeters into the rubble. And then in some areas where um, the rubble is more slope, like a higher grade slope, I'll actually add a one meter um, center peg in as well uh, as an extra anchor point. Uh, so some uh, in some restoration uh, projects in the area, they use similar frames um, that are sitting on top of the substrate. Um, and that is a common method that's used around here in Indonesia and other areas. Um, and so uh, when you put them on top of the substrate, um, quite often they're clustered together with like a few main anchor um, points. Uh, so that does work in more sheltered areas, but in our particular site, just because of the um, fluid dynamics of the area based on the currents, the slope, um, I need to anchor every single structure in. So I have those 30 centimeter long anchors in for each one. Um, but I do find that clusters um, together uh, of structures actually works better for um, making sure that they don't flip over because it just creates that um, uh, a little bit of um, resistance um, as, a, as a mass. Um, but it also helps with the growth of um, attracting uh, fish and other stuff because you create a little mini patch reef instead of an individual structure that's in the middle of a rubble field. Great. Thanks. Unfortunately, we're going to have to um, wrap this up now.
So I just want to thank our speakers one more time and thank all of you for joining us. Liz, would you mind? Thank you. <laughs> um, and a recording of today's webinar will be available at the Reef Resilience Network website. And you can also connect with the Reef Resilience Network on Facebook, Twitter, um, or on YouTube, or by emailing them at resilience at tnc.org. Um, and with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, everyone.